Okay, so now that we have a definition for limits, we're going to go through the basic properties. So let's start with something very basic. Consider the constant function phi. That means a function that takes a value 5 at each x. If it takes a value 5 at each x, whether x is approaching 3 or not doesn't matter, the values are always 5. In particular, of course, the values can be made as close to 5 as we want. Therefore, the limit is 5. In general, if we have a constant function c, its limit at any value a is c. Another very basic fact is that if x is approaching 3, x is approaching 3. Well, we're really not saying much here. Um, and more generally, if x is approaching a, then the limit of the function x at a is a. Now assume that I have a function f that admits a limit at a. And I consider the new function that I obtain by multiplying f by a constant c. And I want to know if this new function has also a limit at a. It turns out that it is, uh, it is the case, and to obtain this limit, you simply multiply the limit of f by the constant c. To illustrate how to use the epsilon delta definition of limit to prove facts about limit, let's take a look at how we would prove this. So we need to show that for every epsilon, we can find a delta such that whenever the distance between x and a is less than that value delta, the distance between c times f of x and c times the limit of f is less than epsilon. Okay, so we know that the function f admits a limit. Let's call that limit L. And we write out the fact that L is a limit using the epsilon delta definition. Now we can write that for any epsilon. So in other words, we can make sure that the values of f of x are within some fixed distance of l by taking x sufficiently close to a. Now we're going to ask the values of f of x to be within epsilon over the absolute value of c of l. This can be done because uh, we can prescribe any distance between f of x and l as long as this is a positive distance. Now for that particular delta, the distance between c times f of x and c times the limit is simply absolute value of c multiplied by the distance between f and l. And the distance between f of x and l is less than epsilon over absolute value of c, so when we multiply, we get epsilon. In other words, for a fixed epsilon, we found a delta for which we get that whenever the distance between x and a is non-zero but less than delta, the distance between c times f of x and c times l is less than epsilon. More generally, if I have two functions f and g that both admit the limit at a, then we may ask whether the product function f times g also has a limit at a. It is the case, and to obtain this limit, you simply multiply the limits of the two functions at a. Now, this would be a good exercise for you to try to mimic what we have done for um, the limit of the constant multiple of the function, in order to show that this more complicated case is also true. Without going into the proof, um, let's look at some consequences. For instance, if I'm looking at the limit of c times x squared at a, we have seen that when I have a constant multiple of a function, I can pull the constant out of the limit. So I get c times limit of x squared. But x squared is really a product of x by itself. And we just have uh, stated the fact that the limit of a product is a product of the limits, provided that both limits exist, and the limit of x at a exists. So this is c multiplied by the limit of x multiplied by itself, in other words, limit of x squared. 
Since the limit of x at a is a, we get c a squared. In other words, we obtain what we would obtain by plugging x equal a in the expression of the function. Now, in general, the limit of c multiplied by a power of x is going to be c multiplied by a to that power if we're looking for the limit at a. In general, if the function f admits a limit at a, then the limit of the nth power of that function at a is simply the nth power of the limit of f at a. Another general rule is that the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. Well, this is not uh, this is not hard to believe if you have something that is approaching 3 and something that is approaching 2 both at the same place so let's say f is approaching 3 when x is um, approaching 1 and g is approaching 2 when x is approaching 1 then when I add these two things together when x is approaching 1 it should approach 2 plus 3 5 nothing surprising here but let's try to see again how we can prove this fact using the epsilon delta definition so we fix an epsilon, and if L and M denote the uh, limits of F at A and G at A, respectively, we need to show that we can find a delta for which whenever the distance between X and A is less than that delta, the distance between F plus G of X and L plus M is less than epsilon. If we write out the fact that L is the limit of f and m is the limit of g, um, we can make f of x within any prescribed distance of L and g of x within any prescribed distance of m by the, taking x sufficiently close to a. So we can do that for the prescribed distance epsilon over 2 for each one of the two functions. Of course, for each function, we may have to use a different delta. Nevertheless, this can be done for two different deltas. And now, we take for delta the minimum of delta 1 and delta 2. Now, note that if x is now within delta of a, it is in particular within delta 1 and within delta 2. So both conditions are satisfied. So that when x is less than delta, if I look at the distance between f plus g of x and l plus m, I can rewrite it as the absolute value of f of x minus l plus g of x minus m. And the triangular inequality tells me that this is less than the sum of the distances. So this is less than the distance between f of x and l and the distance between g of x and m, each one of them is less than epsilon over 2 because x is within delta of a, therefore within delta 1 or delta 2. And therefore the sum is less than epsilon and we are done. So we have seen how to obtain the limit of a sum, of a product, of a power, of a constant multiple. Uh, one thing that remains to be seen is what happens for the limit of a quotient. Is it the quotient of the limit as we would like it to be? Well, indeed, it is the case, but provided that this formula makes sense. In other words, provided that in that formula we do not divide by zero. So certainly that uh, will not work quite as, it, as we expect if the limit at the bottom, the limit of g of x at a, is zero. But if this is not the case, um, then we have uh, that the limit of a quotient is a quotient of the limits. And so that gives us a um, quite complete set of formulas to calculate limits. Now we're going to see what kind of consequences we can obtain from these general limit laws.